Welcome everybody. I'm going to tell the story today. This chapter is called Moses and the Exodus, but it's quite a long chapter so I'm going to split it into two parts. We'll have part one today. So far the story of the Bible which has been told throughout the book of Genesis has centred on four leading figures. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, the patriarchs of Israel. They've been shown to us as very human characters, with a mixture of good and bad qualities. Yet still, the kind of people whom God cho chooses for his purpose. They're all presented as men with a sense of destiny, unaware of the outcome, but believing that God is using them to further some great design. If we try to see them in the context of world history, we should have to say that they were mostly insignificant Bedouin sheikhs. Abraham, who drifted into Palestine from the desert in quest of better pastures for his cattle. Isaac, who seems to have been so ordinary that little or nothing is remembered of him. Jacob, a wily character who eventually became a respectable and prosperous sheep, sheep farmer. And Joseph, the only real success story, who became the first minister of Egypt. The Bible, however, sees them as the founding fathers of Israel, the nation which God had chosen to be the means of bringing the light of truth into the darkness which mankind's folly had created. The period of the patriarchs is, historically speaking, very shadowy indeed. We do not know very much about it apart from the vivid stories that the Bible tells, and the assurance of the archaeologists that the background details are generally confirmed by their discoveries. Scholars are agreed, however, that when we come to Moses and his times, we're on a much more solid ground. We cannot say that all we are told about him is a reliable account of what actually happened. As with the stories of the patriarchs, pious imagination has added its quota of legends to the record. But what is quite indisputable is that Moses stands head and shoulders above all other Old Testament figures and indeed, on any showing, was one of the outstanding men in world history. He was long credited as having been the author of the first five books of the Old Testament. And although this is obviously not the case, his life and work inspired those who compiled them. More than anyone else, he moulded the future of Israel. Muslims and Christians, as well as Jews, revere his memory. It is perhaps too much to say that he made the Hebrews into a nation, gave them a distinctive faith and moral code, but at least he shaped the beginning of all three. When his story opens, the days of the patriarchs were past. Their descendants had long been settled in Goshen and had become a sizeable colony. But alas, they were no longer welcome guests in Egypt, as the Bible puts it. A new king arose over Egypt who had no knowledge of Joseph. It was not just that Joseph's great service to his adopted country had been forgotten. The Egyptians had thrown out the foreign rulers who had been in power in Joseph's time and who made the migration of Jacob and his family possible. The Israelites were now, in about 1300 BC, a minority problem because they were of a different race feared because their numbers were increasing. The pharaoh of the time, Ramesses II, took swift and drastic measures to cut their numbers and break their spirit. The able-bodied men were torn from the fields and press-ganged into slave labour on all the building projects in the great cities which pharaoh had decided to develop. Worse than that, an edict went out that all male infants were to be drowned at birth in the Nile. It was a policy of extermination which Hitler, with more scientific techniques, was to apply to the same race 3,000 years later. Both attempts failed. Hitler failed to wipe out the Jews because, in the providence of God, he lost the war. Ramesses II failed because, also in the providence of God, one boy escaped and grew up to be the saviour of his people. The romantic story is told of how Moses' birth was concealed from the Egyptian authorities and how his mother hid him on the banks of the Nile, 
where he was discovered by an Egyptian princess and brought up in the royal court. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells a tale of Moses as a child in the Egyptian royal palace, throwing the crown of Egypt on the floor as a sign that for all his Egyptian upbringing and his Egyptian sounding name, his destiny lay with his own afflicted and enslaved people. Whatever truth there is in the tale, events settled his future for him. The first act that the Bible records of Moses when he'd grown to manhood shows where his heart lay. It shows him also to have a passionate, to be a passionate and violent man. Hot with anger at the sight of the brutal treatment of one of his Hebrew countrymen by an Egyptian guard, he killed him on the spot. So for Moses, the die was cast. Distrusted by his countrymen as a quisling, outlawed for murder by the Egyptian law, he fled for his life. In Midian, well outside Egyptian territory, he found safety. He found a job and a wife. Living quietly as a shepherd with his young family, he might have seemed to be at the end of his particular road. But God had work for him to do. He laid his hand on him and spoke to him and called him into his service. This was an experience that Moses shared with Amos and Isaiah, with St Paul and St Francis, with Martin Luther and John Wesley. Each of them was singled out for some gigantic task, which was far beyond their own power to accomplish. But God chose them to be the instruments of his purpose and gave them the strength to carry it out. What was Moses' particular task to be? It was so vast and so formidable that his mind boggled. He was to go back to Egypt and lead his people from bondage into freedom. It meant winning their confidence. It meant confronting the new Pharaoh face to face with the demand that he should give the Israelites their freedom. And it meant persuading his countrymen to dare to take that freedom and go with him into an unknown future. The idea which Moses had to sell to these downtrodden, dispirited serfs was that they'd been singled out from all the nations of mankind. They, the most unlikely conglomeration of life's rejects, stateless, landless people of no standing, no power or privilege in the world, they were to be the nucleus of the people of God the foundation members of the Almighty's pilot scheme for the renewal of life in the world. God had selected this unlikely group of slaves. He would mould them, instruct them, inspire them with the words of psalmist and prophet, bring them to the knowledge that through them the world would learn the truth about itself, about the meaning and purpose of life about the beginning and the end of the mystery that surrounds us. Moses felt that his own particular role was well beyond his powers. The only thing that made him attempt it was the conviction that God was behind the enterprise. So back he went to Egypt with his wife and his two little boys on this forlorn hope. Meantime, the plight of his countrymen had become even more acute. Something in them bridled at the thought of having no roots, no rights, no hope, no future. In a sense, their plight was not unlike our own. We too are in the grip of forces beyond our control. Economic forces. Political forces. Automation and technology is here to stay. Machines often count for more and more. Men and women count for less and less. We feel that we do not matter anymore, that we are drifting aimlessly without an anchor and that there is nothing very much that anybody can do about it. That is why this story matters to us still. These Hebrew slaves in Egypt looked into the future and saw nothing ahead but darkness. The one certainty for each of them was that he was chained to his labour until 
broken in body and spirit, he was thrown like refuse into a common grave. Pharaoh's latest edict seemed to spell the end of all hope. His orders were that they were to make the same quantity of bricks each day, but that they would, but that they would have to find for themselves the straw that was necessary to hold the clay together. Bricks without straw. The command was to do the impossible. A political excuse to wipe out the whole people. What had become of the God who in all their wanderings had inspired and encouraged Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Who had richly blessed Joseph? Who had led his people in fairer days into an Egypt that welcomed them and offered them shelter? Where was he now, this God who deserted them? It was then, in their darkest hour, that God sent them a leader.